my colleagues, it is great to have you here. We're going to be exploring some of the differences between Float, Slack, and Lag today in a hopefully relatively short video where you will develop the understanding of these three terms. You'll understand how they affect network diagrams, whether you're doing that for a project management class or an operations class, or maybe even studying for your PMP exam. So let's go ahead and get started. And I think the easiest one to get started with is lag. And so let's do some definitions to start out with. Lag is simply a delay. It is a delay that is introduced into our project network or our schedule that is due to something often outside our control, such as shipping delays something that has to cure. So you think about concrete being poured, you can't start putting up walls on that concrete until it has a little time to dry. Same sort of thing with different cements. They may take some time to dry, like thinking about putting down carpet or something like that. Or we might have other things that have to dry, for example, drywall or paint. So lag uses no resources. That's one thing to consider here. There's no additional labor that's assigned to lag. As far as how lag affects our schedule, it must be added in the forward pass and it must be subtracted in the backward pass. It is also useful in fast tracking and we'll talk about all three of these aspects of lag. So in this first example of a lag, we have someone that is doing some drywall on a construction site. And we have another person that's going to be doing some painting of those walls. However, it takes some amount of time for that drywall to dry and be ready to be sanded down and painted. Let's say that it's two days. That is a lag. That's a lag of two days. There's nobody working on that drywall, but we simply just have to let things sit. Let me give you another example. Let's say that you take your car into a mechanic and that mechanic finds that they in fact need to call the manufacturer of the car and get a part shipped out. So they place that telephone call and it takes three days for the part to be delivered. Then the mechanic can actually install that part in your car. The lag is the three days that it took for shipping. So let's go back to the first example again, where we had two days of lag for the drywall to set up or dry. Well, let's look at how that would work in a forward pass. So A is our drywalling event, and B is our painting event. Well, we start out at zero in the forward pass for A. We add four days of duration. It takes four days to do that drywall work. So we're able to have an early finish of four days. But then we have to add those two days into our calculation when we start to calculate the early start for B. So we add those two days, and in fact, six is now the early start for B. Six plus three is round about nine, and that is how we accommodate or count those lag time periods. So we have to account for those in the forward pass. In the backward pass, we have to do the same thing, but in this case, we subtract it. Let's say that we are making a backward pass here, so 9 subtract 3 uh, gets us to 6 for the late start. Instead of transferring that to the late finish of A, we have to subtract 2 days. We have to count for that both ways here. So that turns into 6 minus 2, which is 4, and then 4 minus 2, which is 0. Same sort of thing for our mechanic example. It only takes your mechanic a day to do the diagnostics on your car and the other work that had to be done. It takes three days of lag and two days to actually install the part and get everything up and running. We do the forward pass through this. We start out at zero, add that one, we get a early finish of one, but then we have those three days of lag so we have to add three days to that one, which should give us something around four. Four plus two is around six, and we are done with the forward pass. Again, in the backward pass, 
we are going to be accommodating or dealing with that lag, but instead of adding it, we're going to be subtracting it. So far, minus 3 is going to give us 1 for the late finish of A, and 0 finally for the late start. Now I mentioned that lag can also be used for fast tracking. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you are mowing a large field and it's going to take you three hours to mow that. I have been hired to come along and rake that field after you're done mowing it. And it's going to take me five hours to do that. So if we have a simple network diagram, we have a finish to start relationship. You're going to finish mowing and then I'm going to start my raking. That takes a total of eight hours. Instead, what we could do is change this into a start-to-start -start relationship with a short lag. So in this case, I'm going to wait 15 minutes after you start mowing, and then I'm going to go ahead and start raking. So these lags are often used when we are fast tracking something and taking a relationship from a finish to start into a start to start. Now, the total time of this project, so to speak, is 5.25 hours. That's 35% less time than our original 8 hours. So it would look something like this in our actual calculations. The early finish of A is going to be 3, but notice B doesn't have a relationship with the finish of A. It has a relationship with the start. So 0 plus 0.25 is around about 0.25, and that gives us an early finish of 5.25. Once again, we would accommodate for that in the backward pass as well. So 0.25 minus 0.25 should be 0. So hopefully that gives you a good understanding of lag. Lag is something that is kind of built into the system. Right? So we have to wait. I don't want to get out there in front of that lawnmower and start getting run over. I want to give them some space. I need that time to give them some space. We need something to dry. We need something to be delivered. So it's kind of fixed in there, and we add and subtract it in our forward and backward pass. It can also be useful then for adding that lag when we move something from a finish to start to a start to start, so-called fast tracking. Now, let's talk about slack or float. Slack or float really refer to the same thing. They are synonymous. Float seems to be more common in software projects. Slack seems to be the term used more commonly in construction projects. But they mean the same exact thing. It is a product of our network diagram or our scheduling of our various tasks. Critical tasks have no slack. Near critical tasks have comparatively little slack. I'm not going to go into the details about near critical tasks, but some project managers will recognize that if they have a task that lasts for 20 days and it has one day of slack, um, that may be very little slack. And so that may get used up. So they may track something called near critical tasks. Slack or float can also be considered a resource that can be used to manage other constraints. The amount of slack or float that we have also changes during project execution. So let's take a look at this from a very simple network diagram. We have a network with two paths. And you see here that A, B, D, and F that represents the critical path, that is the longest path through the network, and it takes 24, let's just say days, 24 days to move through the network in the longest path. However, if we're adding up all the durations between A, C, E, and F, then that's only 20 days. So we would consider that there has to be at least four days of slack or float in the path that is not critical here. So in other words, we could delay C, and it would probably not affect D 
overall project time. So let's say that C takes four days instead of three. Well, that's going to affect our forward pass calculation. It's going to affect the calculations on E. However, the calculations on F remain the same. And in fact, the duration of our project remains at 24 days. However, what has happened is we've used up some amount of slack. Notice the difference between 24 and 21. Well, that's just three. So there's only three days of slack in the path A, C, E, and F. So what happens if E takes a little bit longer to get done? Let's say it takes six days now. So now we have a situation where the early finish of E has definitely been affected, but we still have not affected F. However, every path through this network is now critical. There's zero amount of slack in any task or any path through the network. Well, what if it's even worse than that? What if E ends up taking seven days? So now we have a situation where E has not only affected itself, its early finish, but has also affected F. And in fact, the critical path has changed. So now A, C, E, and F is going to take 25 days, and it's the critical path A, B, D, and F is only going to take 24 days. So when we talk about slack or float, we want to consider how a change to the duration of one task is going to affect either the overall project time or the time for subsequent tasks to start or get finished. So this is where the difference between free slack and total slack comes into play. So free slack is the amount of time until other tasks are affected. So the amount of slack that we have on a particular task before it affects other tasks. The total slack is the amount of time until project end time is affected. This is often shared with other tasks. Let me go back to our original example and show you what I mean. We would say that C has a total slack of four, meaning four days could be added to C without affecting the end time of the project. However, it has a free slack of zero because if C takes even one day longer, that's going to affect E as far as when it can start. And it's important to keep track of that because you may have scheduled somebody to be on site uh, to do the work of E that is waiting for C to get done. And they may be just sitting there twiddling their thumbs for an extra day if you're not monitoring this closely. So we are interested to know not only what is the total slack, but what is the free slack for our various tasks. So if you think about it, if C were to take four days instead of three, this would affect not only the early finish of C, but also the early start and early finish of E. It would also reduce the amount of slack on E as well as C by a day. So in this case, the total slack for both C and E will be the same. It will be three days. The free slack of C is still zero. And the free slack of E, however, is now three days. There are three days that E could be delayed before it affected F. So in many ways, we consider that the slack, that is the total slack, is shared between these two tasks. So C cannot take an extra three days, and E cannot also take up an extra three days. If that happens, our project will be delayed. So I said at the beginning that Slack or Float can also be used almost like a resource that we can have at our disposal to solve other types of problems, often resource constraint problems. Let me run you through a very quick scenario to illustrate this point. So I have here a relatively simple project network. A is a task that gets done during our first week of work. B, C, and D are dependent on A getting done. And E is dependent on B, C, and D getting done. So C has two weeks of slack. D has three weeks of slack. Let's say that in order to complete B, C, and D, we have to have some specialized equipment to do that work. Maybe it's an earth-moving device. 
So each of those needs one of these earth movers in order to successfully complete the task in the given time period. However, what would happen if we only have access to two of these earth moving devices? We don't happen to own three of them, we only own two of them. So how are we going to resolve this resource allocation problem? Well, there's a number of ways that we could do that. We could go out and buy another piece of earth moving equipment. That would be expensive. We could use a service like Equipment Share to go out and rent some earth moving equipment for a short period of time for that one week that we need to get the job done. However, both of those are going to increase the cost of the project. So the question is, can we use the slack resource or the float resource in order to solve this resource allocation problem. And in fact, we can. So if we look at the number of resources that are required during each week, we once again see that during that second week of work, we're gonna have a problem. We have a resource allocation problem. We need those three earth movers. The second week we need two earth movers and the third and the fourth week we just need one earth mover. So what we do is we sacrifice some of that slack and we push D to not start until week three. It now only has one week of slack, so we have burned up two weeks of slack by doing this. However, we can now get the work done with just the two earth movers that we happen to own or have in our possession. So in this way, Slack is a resource we've been able to use. There's no increase in cost to our project. So that's pretty nice. So savvy project managers will use Float or Slack as a resource in order to solve these resource allocation problems without driving up the cost of the project. Without going into much detail, I'm going to at least mention that you can, in fact, use Float or Slack to solve resource allocation problems, but you can also do it to smooth out your utilization curve. So let's say you happen to actually have three bulldozers. Well, do you want to have to cart three bulldozers out to the job site? Then after one week of work, one of the bulldozers comes back to your main office, and then after Another week of work, the second bulldozer comes back, and then you just leave one bulldozer out there. Well, if you shift that, once again, you've kind of smoothed out the hills and valleys in your resource utilization curve. I hope this video has helped you, my colleagues, to understand the differences between lag and slack or float. If you like this video, please do like it. Please subscribe. Please let me know what other types of videos, what other types of concepts you'd like to see me explain.